this tells me I'm live. Good to see everybody here this afternoon. I am looking for the signal on my laptop. There it is. All right. Good to see everybody this evening. Glad you're able to join us uh, on this cold, cold winter night. It sounds like we've got a, what the weatherman's telling us, we've got a, a major Arctic blast that's, uh, that's headed our way, and we've got the leading edge of it right now. And so it's pretty chilly tonight, but I'm um, so thankful that not only uh, those in-house are here, but those that are joining us online this evening, you're here as well. Uh, Brother David is working this afternoon, and so uh, Brother David, I uh, hope you're able to catch us and you're not out on a call on this, uh, on this cold winter night uh, at the fire department. Um, I am going to uh, be taking a look at a section of scripture in 1 Timothy so why don't y'all join me in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, I'm going to read verses 14, 15, and 16. Hey, Miss Margaret, it's so good to see you. Feels like it's 10 degrees in Oklahoma. I am glad I'm not in Oklahoma, but it's pretty chilly here as well. All right. And all the others that are... Uh, that are watching and that are joining us online. I am looking at 1 Timothy. Let me type that in. Uh, 1 Timothy. Uh, we're going to look at chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. There we go. I just typed that on the comment section. I hope I spelled everything right because I don't have my glasses. And so, um, in your own in your own words, I don't have any one to walk a microphone around for me tonight. But uh, for those of you that are online, and those of you that are in house, and others are starting to uh, uh, starting to join us, I, I want to talk about um, a word tonight. This is just some stuff I've been studying in my uh, in my own personal time. But I want to talk to you about the word godliness, or to be godly. Uh, you know, the word tells us that we're supposed to be holy for he is holy. And there's another description of uh, how we're supposed to be. And we're supposed to be, uh, 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 have godly traits to us. If Christ lives in us and we're walking out the, um, the attributes and the testimony of Jesus, then... Godliness is one of those things, and a lot of people say, well, no, I'm not supposed to be godly. I'm not supposed to ha have a, a, a sense of godliness about me. Well, you are. And do you realize that, that just believing in Christ and being born again, that's having a, a godly trait, putting your faith and your trust in Jesus? And so we're going to take a look at some of those. There's actually six of them listed, but... Does anybody have any idea of what godliness is? What godliness is? Uh, uh, maybe a quick definition or an example. I, I looked up, while you're thinking, I looked up uh, what Matthew Henry said about godliness. And he said, godliness is living a fruitful, obedient, and Christian life. A fruitful, obedient, Christian life. And so when I thought about that and thought about those three words he used to describe that, um, so when we're not living godly uh, and we're not producing fruit, uh, a lot of Christians are, at that point, they're described as being backslidden. You know, I, I have... I am walking the Christian life, but my life is, if my life is not fruitful, in other words, I'm not living in obedience to our Lord and Savior, then I'm going to be backslidden. If you're truly saved, if you've given your heart to, and life to Christ. He also said it is one of seven qualities we are instructed to add to our faith after we become a Christian. And so this is just one of the seven qualities. So I'm, I'm studying through all of those. But this one is God, that we have to live a godly or take on 
a, a godliness quality about us. And, and I've heard many people say, many Christians, and they say it out of humility. They want to say it out of humility. You know, I can't do that. You know, I, I can't have a, a sense of godliness about me. And, and I hear what you're saying, and, and I see to an extent what you're saying, but at the same time, it's not you, but it's Christ living in you and through you that gives you that, that godliness um, uh, reference or that godliness attribute about you. Uh, this, um, these seven qualities that we're instructed to add to our faith after we become a Christian. Godliness, there are 16 references to the word godliness in Scripture. All of them are in the New Testament. Most of them come from 1 Timothy and 2 Peter. So that's where I've been studying this past few weeks in 1 Peter and excuse me, 1 Timothy and 2 Peter, looking at all of these references about godliness and of course the other the other uh, six attributes. Again, this is just one of them. And I just wanted to kind of uh, just press in on this thing called godliness that we're supposed to have in our lives. And when I look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, 15, and 16, I want, you to, um, I want us to look at that real quick, these verses, and then I'm going to pray. It says, These things Timothy has written in this first letter. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And then it goes through in verse 16, six things. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. That's quite a list, isn't it? Of those six things concerning godliness. And when I look at that, I say, well, that is... For people in the Bible, those things don't apply to me when it comes to godliness. Is that what you think? Absolutely wrong. All of those things apply to our lives. And say, how, how, what is the application for these things in my life? To have a godliness trait about me. I want us to look, um, starting back at the beginning of verse 14. I want to point out a couple of things to you. First of all, prior to verse 14, if you're looking at chapter 3, you will see in the preceding verses, like verse 1 through 13, you're going to find the qualities of an elder or overseer, and you're going to find the qualities for a deacon. And what is, uh, what is expected of those People when they are selected and brought before uh, the church and presented as uh, their lives of having a calling of either elder or deacon. Now these, these qualities that are listed there in both of those offices, if I take that same mindset as the writer was writing this, he's also giving us the qualities for believers on how we should have one of the seven qualities, as uh, Matthew Henry is talking about here, of godliness. Oh, Brother Wilton, I, I'm a sinner saved by grace. There's nothing godly about me. Yes, it is, Jesus. Yes, it is, Jesus. So don't let the devil uh, convince you that you should not have a sense of godliness about you. You are not a god. Let's get that straight. And, but by saying that there's godliness qualities about you, it's not you, but it's Christ in you. You're going to hear me say that a lot tonight. So I look at verse 14. And so now we're getting to this section of Scripture uh, that is, I have a subtitle in my Bible, and it's called The Great Mystery. 
the great mystery. And that's where verse 14 starts. And it says, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. This is Paul writing, or Paul speaking, and is wanting Timothy to know that, hey, I'm coming to you and I desire to be there with you. He says that a lot in his letters. But he said, If I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. Has anybody ever given you instructions on how you're supposed to act in God's house? My parents did. Don't you run in church? Don't come to this altar unless it's to repent. All the other people come up to this, come up to this altar, to the platform. And when I was growing up, is those that are leading the music, that's playing the piano and playing the organ. That's the only two instruments we had in the church at that time because nobody else knew how to play anything. Every once in a while we had a music minister that knew how to play guitar. And if you're leading in worship, you come up here. Only other time is you respect the altar of God and that you come up here and you do business with God. This was a place uh, at the front of the church. This was a place where the gospel and the truth of the word of God was proclaimed and then as believers we were to respond to that. Now listen, there's nowhere in scripture where it says that children are not supposed to run in church. But my parents used things like that to help me to understand there are ways that you are supposed to conduct yourself that is reverent to the things of God. And so he's writing here and he says, but if I am delayed, in verse 15, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Now, he drives that point home to say there's some godliness that's taking place. It is the house of God, and it is a place where, that is the church of the living God. And it said it's the pillar and the ground of the truth. Do y'all have any other thing in your Bible and, uh, that you might be either in-house or online? Do you have anything else that it's the pillar and the ground of truth? So when I read through that, and now it's, it's, he's, he's using adjectives to describe the church of the living God. And he said it is the pillar and the ground of truth. Do you have another word for ground or pillar? Bastion? I'm not so sure what that, bastion, what is that word? Like a fort? Or something that is strong that can be protected. All right? Does anybody else have any, anything? And I'm looking online if you have any other words to describe. There you go, Miss D. Miss D says she has something that's uh, a foundation. A pillar is a support. So if I take Margaret's and, and, and Miss D's um, descriptions and I use their words, it is the pillar. In other words, it is the support and the foundation of truth. So when you come into the house of God, there's a sense of godliness that when we walk in here, it is the house of God. And so there needs to be a reverential respect for the house of God. And so it goes on a little bit further and it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now when, I talk, when, when he was writing, he said, Is the mystery of godliness, it is... It is uh, uh, hidden truths, if you will. When, you, when that word mystery is used, it's not like it's magic or anything like that, but it's saying the mysteries of godliness, that, that, that it is hidden truths. And so he begins to unfold six things that I believe for us it's, it's no longer hidden, that if we're going to take on godliness... Godliness attributes. That doesn't mean that we walk around with this fake halo and a, and a coat hanger wire down the back of our shirt and we got this fake halo and this white robe and we want to say, I am holy. That's, that's, you know, that, that's the kids' Christmas play or the kids' Easter play as one of them is trying to portray an angel. That As they portray that angel, that they that the whoever's directing that you've seen kids do that before that they're trying to capture that quality of godliness in that angel so that when you see that you immediately say that's an angel 
And you know that's an angel because of the way they're dressed and the, the coat hanger wire that's got the little gold glitter halo over the tops of their heads. And, and it's really cute to see the kids that are portraying that. But whoever is directing that, people see that that person is an angel. Have you ever seen any dramas before where Jesus is portrayed as the resurrected Christ? When Jesus is portrayed as the resurrected Christ, I've seen rooms that represent the tomb and a bright light comes on and Jesus comes walking out and he's got this white robe of righteousness on and, and that his hair is white and he's got a big beard and it's white and everything about him, there's godliness, there's righteousness in that play. And so when you see him, you go, that's Jesus. No doubt whatsoever, that is a representation of Jesus. And so when we talk about this thing called godliness, that quality that we're supposed to have, it's supposed to have the same effect. That when people see you uh, at the grocery store, people see you, uh, your neighbors out in the yard, and you're working on your lawnmower because your lawnmower won't crank, and they're hearing everything that you're saying, and they're, they're watching you work on that lawnmower. You know, everything about, yep, that's a Christian. Yep, that's a Christian. Their halo looks a little shaky, <laughs> but that, that, that's, that's an angel. That's a Christian. And there's godliness qualities about you that has nothing to do with you other than that you've identified yourself with Christ and that you're born again. Everything else past that points people to Jesus. And so this, this, this quality... Seven of them all throughout scriptures, but the, the, this one particular one, godliness, it's fruitful, it's obedient, and it identifies you as a Christian. So let's step through, if we could, these, this mystery that, that, that Paul is trying to unfold to, uh, to Timothy so that Tim, Timothy can even teach his church. And so the first thing he goes for, is he says... Um, um, he said, God was manifested in the flesh, so that great is the mysteries of godliness. And he says, God was manifest in the flesh, number one. God was manifest in the flesh. This proves that he is God. He is the eternal word and that the word was made flesh. So all through scriptures, we see 1 John chapter 1, verse 14, actually says that the word was made flesh. And so when you look at this first thing and you say, God was made flesh. So what does that application have to do with me? Now work with me as I walk through these. The Word was made flesh. If we did not have the Word of God, the Scriptures, the Word of God, the Word of God is which becomes alive in our lives. And through the preaching of the Word, the reading of the Word, the Spirit of God for us, the Spirit of God, under the preaching or the reading of the Word of God, convicts us and reveals to us our sin state. After we become a Christian and we're saved, it is the Word of God that helps us to maintain that godliness quality about us. In other words, the fruit, the obedience, and the Christian life, it is that thing that helps us on a daily basis to continue to walk in that manifested word made flesh, that manifested thing that God did in Christ. So the word became flesh. So that's one of the first mysteries. Can we explain it? No. But by faith, do we believe it? Yes, as Christians. So the second thing he says is that he is justified in the spirit. Justified in the spirit. So it says, whereas he, repro he, is, he is the reproach, uh, he was reproached as a sinner. This is what Matthew Henry says. Whereas he was reproached as a sinner and put to death as a malefactor, he was raised again by the Spirit. So he was justified from all the calamities which, uh, which was loaded on him. In other words, all the sin that was placed on him and he was made sin for us and was delivered for our offenses. But being raised again, he was justified in the spirit and was made 
uh, so he rose again for our justification and was delivered for our offenses. He was justified by the Spirit. What Matthew Henry is basically saying is that he came in word, word made flesh. He came in the flesh. He died for our sins and was made sin. The man who knew no sin became sin. And he died justly and rightly for our sins according to God's plan. And then he rose again, which made us now justified if we put our faith and our trust in Christ. Can we fully explain the transaction that took place that day when Jesus rose from the grave? We can't fully comprehend the magnitude of all of that, but by faith we believe that we are justified in Christ. And so when he lists, when Paul lists this second thing out, he says, God was manifested in the flesh. We believe it. The Word became flesh. We were justified in the Spirit. Romans chapter 4, verse 25 says, He, Jesus, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now when we say our justification, it means that we are made right when we put our faith in Jesus, that we are made right before God. Jesus justified us in his death, burial, and resurrection. And so he says, hey, this is a great mystery and we can't fully comprehend it, but these, these qualities can be made real in our lives. So he steps through the third one and he said, he who was seen by angels. I was like, well, wait a minute. God, if I'm, if I'm supposed to take on godliness, I, I am not an angel and I have never seen an angel that I know of. Scriptures tell us we entertain angels unaware as we walk out our godliness. And so sometimes I'll scratch my head and I go, hmm. Afterwards, hindsight, I'm like, could that have been? I don't know if y'all ever had that experience before, but I have. Did something for the, in the name of Jesus and, and circumstances began to become more clear after I helped that person. And then I think, wow. Case in point, I'll give you this illustration to kind of see. Um, Sarah and Josh were in an accident. You know, remember that I shared a little bit about that uh, not long before we, we came here. In that accident, there was an EMS guy that was helping Sarah on the side of the road. Sarah's door opened and she was able to go out of the house, I'm out of the car, not the house, the car. And she's sitting on the side of the road. She's talking to me and she said, Dad, my shoulder hurts real bad. I think my wrist is broke. Sarah, I'm on, I'm on the way. Just, you know, she was just up the road from me, uh, from the church I was at. And I said, Sarah, I'm on my way. Her and Josh were coming up to the church to meet me. And actually, Christy and the rest of the kids were coming behind them. And uh, a man pulled out in front of uh, Sarah and Josh. And Sarah ditched the car. And they hit a tree. I said, Dad, Josh is all messed up. Okay, we know he's got broke bones. What about you? Dad, I think my wrist is broke. And my collarbone, my collarbone might be broke. I'm going to be praying for you. Sarah, I'm on my way. And uh, uh, are you okay? Well, I think I am, Dad, but I'm, you know, I can't take a deep breath and so on. Sarah says that while she was, this is her testimony, while she was sitting there on the side of the road, this, the CMS guy comes up to her. And uh, he begins to talk to her and tell her, so you don't have to worry. Um, uh, you're in good hands. Uh, I served in the military. I was a paramedic. Um, uh, I've, I've, I've served in, in, in battle, and so she said, guy looked like he's, you know, maybe 30s. And, um, and she said uh, he was checking her shoulder and getting her to move her arm. And he said, I think you just have a dislocated shoulder. So let me see if I can pop it back in place. He said, I don't think you got anything broke. And he told Sarah what to do, and Sarah said, next thing you know, he just kind of, you know, squeezed and she said, pop my shoulder back in place. And she's like, oh, I can finally get a deep breath. And he said, I think you're going to be okay. And he said, let me go check on, on everybody else. And Sarah said, okay. Well, I get into the ambulance with Josh. 
Sarah gets in the ambulance with me. And there were two people in the ambulance. Looks well, nothing like the two people that, Sarah, that the guy that Sarah described to me. And I said, where's the other EMS guy? Are you the two guys for this ambulance? Yes. There was only one ambulance there. A bunch of other first responders was way out in the country. For those of you that, that have been to Milldale, we were about, uh, about a half to three quarters of a mile from Milldale Baptist Church. And so and that's where, we, that's where Sarah had her wreck. So it's out in the country. First responders everywhere. Um, Full-time uh, uh, firemen, thank the Lord for them, that were getting off shift and they were on their way home. And they stopped to help that live up in that Zachary area. Got to asking the, the, the firemen, hey, w what happened to that EMS guy? Because the two guys that were in the ambulance, because I was looking for him, I wanted to thank him. And um, we don't know who you're talking about. We don't know who you're talking about. We've never seen the guy. That guy doesn't work for us. We don't have anybody that looks like that works for us. And so I went back to Sarah and I said, Sarah, were you conscious or unconscious? And of course she looked at me, Dad, I was conscious. I'm telling you. I, ta I had a conversation. The man is real. And I was like, hmm. That's one of those, hmm. Wonder if we entertain and that's happened with, with something like that. And so when you look at what, um, in 1 Timothy, what Paul was saying, he was seen by angels. Let's take a look at what, what uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6 says, um, that they worshipped him. And again, uh, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he said, let all of the angels of God worship him. And so what Paul was saying here, he was seen of angels that Jesus, the Messiah, was, was worship, the angels worshipped him and they witnessed all the things that Jesus had done. And so this, this uh, hidden mystery about godliness is not about whether you've seen an angel or whether you are becoming an angel. That's, that's totally off base. What he's talking about is that the angels worshipped Jesus. And that's one of, the, one of the things in godliness. People look at our worship and they see how you worship. Do you live a life that worships God? Do you live a life that is, a, that is an example of worshipping the one that became flesh from the word? And so I look at what uh, the angels did in their worship and it says... Um, and the angels worshiped God and they attended his incarnation which the word became flesh in other words his birth they were there worshiping in the temptation in his agony and his death and his resurrection and hallelujah in his ascension an angel was apparent in every one of these accounts in scripture and in, in the ascension in the last one if you can remember and from the birth they were announcing uh, to uh, the world that Jesus was, uh, the Messiah has come, the Word has been made flesh. And then we, in the ascension, as the, as the disciples stood gazing up into the sky, an angel said, why are you standing there gazing? Basically, guys, you got work to do. The same way you've seen him ascend into heaven is the same way he's coming back. And you guys have got a lot of work to do. Now let's get busy. And so I'm paraphrasing here, but that's what the angel was saying. And so what does that godliness as respect of being seen of angels, what does that have to do? The angels worshiped. And so uh, another side of godliness in us is how you worship. Now here's a question for those of you that are listening online and for those of you that are in-house. True or false? Here's your test question. Worship is singing and that's all I need to do when I when people look at my worship that's how I sing true or false and I'll wait for the answers do do <laughs> you hope not because you're sunk Brandon said he's sunk exactly and that's a big old false now that might be a part of it it's a blessing to see people worship 
The Bible says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. No matter how you talk, no matter if you stutter, no matter if you can carry a tune in a bucket, uh, we're all going to be worshiping in music and lifting our voices and worship to Him. And I think that's a part of it. I mean, if you come into church and you sit there looking like you've been uh, uh, weaned on pickle juice, and uh, uh, you, you, I mean, you have no attribute of worship about you, uh, that's not going to look too good. I mean, people are going to be, you know, lost people come to church. Backslidden people come to church. And when they see you and they see you not worshiping in any way, shape, form, or fashion, and, and you look like you don't want to be at church, I mean, that's, is that a form of godliness that, that you should take on? No, it's not. But some people think that, okay, worship, when, when I look at the scriptures and I see that the angels worshiped, they were there. Listen to this, man, listen to this. They were there with him from start to finish, from beginning to end. They worshiped the Lord Jesus. They worshiped him at his incarnation, at his temptation, in his agony, in his death. They were worshiping through, through his death. They were worshiping, they were there that God bankrupted heaven to send Jesus to this earth and the man who knew no sin became sin that we might be justified if we put our faith in him. And then we can walk with one of the seven attributes that, that we're talking about here in godliness that I can be godly in my worship. So what, is, what this is saying is that I can worship God from start to finish from the time that I get saved to the time God calls me home, in my fleshly life, I can worship God. I can also worship God in the good times, and I can worship God in the bad times. And so basically when I look and it says, as was seen of angels, they worship. We need to worship in the same way. And it's not just singing. It's not just singing. Do you have any ideas of other ways that your lives can represent uh, worship? Anybody online? What other ways can, you, can your life represent worship? How else can you worship other than singing? Giving? Giving is an act of worship. And so when you give your tithe or your offering, which is above your tithe, Whenever you give your tithe or your offering, that is an act of worship. Do you realize that when you get up and give your tithes, which by the way, uh, um, I don't have the numbers here with me, but God opened the windows of heaven in January and blessed our socks off here at the church for our finances for January ending the first month. And I just praise the Lord for that. Thank you, Jesus. But when you, when you give your tithes and you get up and go to the chest of Joash, you're, and again, your, your worship is not about you. It's not about like Ananias and Sapphira who were waving their offerings and saying, look what we're sacrificing. That's a heart condition gone wrong. But when you get up, you're a, you're a witness in an act of worship, you're testifying that God owns 100%. And what I'm giving to the Lord is an act of worship. Is there any other way? I'm looking here. Prayer, Brother Earl says. Exactly. Um, Shelby, hey Shelby, it's so good to see you on with us this evening. Serving. Serving is a big way of as, as an act of worship. If you're out uh, helping those that are less needy, for those of you that work Fruitful Harvest is a food pantry, for example, on Mondays. That is an act of service. That is an act of worship. You're being the hands and feet of Jesus. And so some people are gifted that way. Others are saying, you know, uh, uh, this past Monday, rain or shine, uh, we're going to be giving away, uh, we're going to be giving away uh, food to the needy. Well, there are some people uh, that uh, it's what the whole body of Christ is about. Some people are hands and some people are feet and some people are eyes and some people are noses and some people look at that, that, uh, uh, that job at Fruitful Harvest and, and serving in that capacity and say, I'm not all about that. You know, that's lifting boxes and you know, I'm not gifted in that area and I'm, 
I, I, we've got to meet strangers and all of that. And you might say, that's not my gifting. But your gifting might be, you know what? I see the gym floor is dirty. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go surprise somebody and I'm going to cut... Uh, I'm, I'm going to surprise somebody and I'm going to clean, get the machine out of the closet and I'm going to clean the gym floor. Here's something else. Let me give this to you. Somebody came and cut the grass here at the church and it wasn't the normal guys that, that we pay. I don't know who it was. That was an act of worship. Somebody else might say, I don't like cutting grass. I don't like cutting grass. Don't want to cut grass. Especially with it cold. Who wants to cut grass right now? Somebody said, that's my gifting. And that's how I want to serve. And so whoever was cutting grass here, as the cars rode by, they said, that's an act of worship. Why? That's an act of service. Why is somebody doing that in a time like this? And so, and, and I could just go on and name other things, but an act of worship and what they're saying here, he was seen of angels. It is a witness and a testimony from start to finish in the good times and the bad times that I'm going to worship the Lord. Number four, he said, he is preached unto the Gentiles. It's a great part of the... Savior, that whereas before salvation... wall was now taken down and the Gentiles set thee to be a light of and so what is our act of godliness to the Jew and the Gentile in other words we preach the gospel message to everyone well some people say well I can't preach some people say I can't sing Brandon other people say I can't preach how can I have a godly attribute? I want all of these things. you got all of them. But to actually stand in front of somebody and to, to preach like what I'm doing here this evening or to teach, that might not be how you're gifted. But according to this, I've set before you to be a light to the Gentiles. In other words, I'm going to go back to Brother Earl's word that I can be a living testimony. Do you realize that uh, when you stood up in the baptistry, whether it was here or wherever it was, that you gave your first testimony, your, you preached your first sermon, that you're saying, I'm identifying myself in Christ. I have given my heart and life to Christ. I am identifying myself with Him through the obedience of baptism. And everybody here, evidently at New Beginnings, is affected by those, those two kids that we baptized week before last because everybody stood up and everybody was clapping. Clapping for what? You were excited about the message that they were preaching. They were testifying, I just got saved, and now the first act of obedience is baptism, and I'm going to be baptized. And so they were baptized, and the church celebrated. And so it might not be occupationally for you to be called to preach, but all of us can be alike. All of us can have a testimony. Now we'll go to, go to the fifth one. That he was believed on in the world so that he was not preached in vain. Many of the Gentiles welcomed the gospel which the Jews rejected. And so when I look at what Matthew Henry is saying and I look at this fifth attribute, believed on in the world, and I'm like, what does that have to do? Again, I'm trying to wrap my mind around this, this attribute of this quality, godliness, that a lot of people say, oh, no, 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 I'm not godly. Yes, you are. And don't let the devil rob you of that because Christ lives in you. And basically, these six things we're running through, if you know Christ, they're present in your, in your life. And so when I looked at this and I was like, that, that he was believed on in the world. And that's basically at your point of salvation. And not only at your point of salvation, but if you live out that salvation testimony, that many others will welcome the gospel into their life as well. Why? Because as further we move down this list, the more 
of these things of godliness is going to be present in your life and people are going to say, what is it different about you? There's something about you that's not like everybody else. What is it? And what they're doing is they're paying you one of the greatest compliments of saying, I recognize the quality of godliness in you and it's not about you, but it's Christ living in you and through you. So we don't wave our, our Christian flag around or polish our halo up because we've done something good. No, it's a love relationship with Jesus that I'm just walking it out. I'm just walking it out. And when I do that, people see the message that you're preaching and they say, well, I, you know, you must be a believer in Christ. I'm telling you, I was sitting in my office at the university and I had that couple come into my office and I love ducks and, and old, old antique um, um, decoys, uh, old wooden decoys, and I collected them at the time. And I had a lot of them on my bookshelves. I had uh, 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 duck hunting wallpaper and duck hunting pictures in my office at the university. And this mother and, and father came in with their son, and they sat down in my office and uh, as soon as they sat down, I put my hands on my desk, folded my fingers like this, put my hands down on my desk, and I said, how can I help you all today? I worked in the financial aid office. I, I helped with grants, loans, scholarships, all that good stuff. How can I help you all today? You're one of them, aren't you? Well, what do you mean I'm one of them? Nothing in my, oh, no crosses, no no hidden Bible in my bookshelf buried among a bunch of books of, on philosophy or duck hunting. I, I, just, I didn't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I didn't, I just didn't, I just like duck hunting and like decoys. And so that's the way my office was decorated. I don't know. I just didn't hang one whole wall with crosses like some of the ladies do sometimes. Nothing wrong with that. But I just didn't have it in my office. You're one of them, aren't you? Are you talking about me? Yeah, I'm talking about you. You're one of them, aren't you? I was like, one of what? And I was thought he was talking about, you're a duck hunter. You're one of them, aren't you? I said, one of what? He said, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said, sir, there is nothing in my office that says anything to that fact. There's nothing around. I mean, I haven't said it. Why are you even asking me that question? He said, I can just tell. I can just tell. I can just tell the way you're acting. I can tell the way is what's in your voice. And he was, he was like offended by it. And God just began to swell up in my, well up in my heart. Hey, it's not about you. It's about me. And he's seeing me in you. So you just, you just, you just do everything. Love him. Love him, love him. And I was like, well, yes, sir, I am. And I said, but I'm not here to preach a message to you. And I'm thinking I'm already preaching a message. Jesus is. And it's that godliness, that it's the super, it's the mystery of godliness. It's the mystery. How does God do that? By way of his spirit, that's the vehicle. But how does he do it? I don't know. He's God. And I just want to be just a vase. I just want to be a willing vessel to be filled up and to pour, be poured out for the cause of Christ. I can't even pour my own self out. I'm like a vase. I just got to sit there. God's the one that's got to pick me up, fill me, and pour me out and then set me back down. I want to be used for his, his purpose and His cause. And so when I look at this, and it says that He was believed on in the world. So it was preached, and then it was, He was believed on in the world. Godliness says that you have believed on Christ. Godliness says that that belief in Christ is now projected toward others that they may also believe. That's God's plan. That's not ours. It's a mystery, and I don't completely understand it. But all I know is, is there's a burning in my bones, and there's a burning in my spirit to see other people come to Christ. And that's why I look for every hook that I can put in the water. I'll, draw, I'll drive hundreds of miles to draw a black light picture that represents Jesus if somebody will come to the knowledge of or believe in the word of the living God, Jesus, and trust Him as Savior. I'll get up in the middle of the night out of a dead sleep and talk to somebody, if they, and I have, that they are troubled in their heart 
that they're not saved. And I want to give them that message. And I want them to help to understand the truth of the word of the living God. The truth. Dispel any lies that might be there. And they may receive the truth into their heart. I can't do it. But the Spirit of God can do it through me and in that other person. That they might believe on in this world. That they can believe on it in this world. The last one, and I'm done, it says, And that he was received up into glory. In his ascension is basically what it's saying. This indeed was before he was believed on in the world, but it, was, uh, but it is put last because it was the crown of his exaltation. Now Matthew Henry gets a little, well he gets a little deep here. And in that he's saying that, that we believe, Paul wrote this and he says that we believe that he was received up into glory. Now we might see that on the back end, but Matthew Henry is saying the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus and the ascending up into glory to retake the right hand of the Father to retake his throne position. Matthew Henry says that that was already completed in heaven. And so in order for us to take on that act of godliness, that not only do we believe that Jesus rose, as Scripture says, and the disciples gazed up into heaven, and there that angel was worshiping, and then eventually spoke to those guys and said, Hey, the same way you've seen him leave, he's coming back in like manner. The same way you've seen him go up, he's coming back down. But when he comes back down the second time, he's coming back down as Lord and King. He will come back as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the true Lord, the true King. And so as he's, we, we do believe in that and we do preach that. But what Matthew Henry is saying is that was already a completed work in heaven. As Jesus retook the right hand of the Father, set back down in his rightful, glorious place, and as he did that, mystery of the gospel. The best thing I can the most uh, tangible thing, and God is not a tangible person per se. He's a spirit. But the biggest thing, I mean the greatest thing I can relate to that is just standing there looking, possibly from a distance, watching those disciples as they're talking to Jesus and Jesus is giving them some final words and then eventually Jesus ascends into heaven he begins to float, begins to levitate and he went through the clouds and he went through the heavens into the third heavens where heaven is God's throne Jesus' throne and those disciples just stood there looking hey I believe that Jesus was received up into glory but Jesus was received up into glory long before he came down, died, and rose again. He was already glorified as the Son of God. And so as we believe in that complete story, it's a mystery. I don't completely understand it. But from number one to number six, in all of these things that Paul was trying to relate to Timothy, hey, there's a way you're supposed to act in church. And there's some things concerning churches that is... Um, that is a foundation and that is its strength as referred to as the pillar and the, and the um, what was it? The pillar and the, um, what was it? Support and the ground. The pillar and the ground. And so there's more to it than that. And it's, it's as we come into the church that we have an attitude of godliness about us. And so as we worship as we walk out, do you know your words have a sense of uh, worship about you? Your attitude has a sense of worship. Your actions has a sense of worship. Worship, it just isn't defined as singing. And so um, I look at all of these things. Hey, Dean, and, and it, he, Dean wrote on here is one of the comments that we plant seeds. And in that last one that we're talking about, that's exactly what that's about. That as we live it out, we preach it out, we walk it out in our actions and attitudes, that everything about us, that godliness, plants seeds in all of those who see us and see the testimony. And so if you get a chance, you want to read some more of that out of 1 Timothy and out of 2 Peter.
there's some other things there concerning those attributes and it's, uh, it's amazing to see how our God reigns and how much He loves us and cares for us. And so, uh, and in His justification, He justified us in His submission and in His obedience. He justified us that though we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And as He died for us, wow, He set our, he set our feet in heavenly places as we trust Jesus and we walk with Him day by day. And so uh, your answer, if somebody says, hey, can I have a sense of godliness about you? Absolutely, you can. And it's not done with an arrogance or pride. It's got nothing to do with you and it's got everything to do with Him through you. Amen? Amen. I got a couple of things. I'm going to uh, look at some prayer requests here. And if you uh, have any prayer requests online, any of you that uh, want to type those in that I don't have on my list here, uh, I want to uh, want to be praying for those as well. Uh, um, I've got Miss Babre has asked us to be praying for Brother Brian. Uh, her husband, Brian McFarland, is uh, having uh, some issues with some hives and some uh, medical issue that he's been battling for a while, and so we want to be praying for him. Uh, Miss Alma Pangle is seeing a doctor in Dallas. February 22nd about her knee, so we want to lift her up. Uh, Miss Peggy has, uh, Platts has asked us to pray for her son, Sean, is having some heart issues. Uh, Kathy Payne is in Garland with her son, wants us to pray for her health. Uh, Miss Deborah Nixon uh, needs, a, needs favor for an available apartment in Sulphur Springs. Pray that she is able to find an apartment that meets her needs financially. And so um, uh, we'll be praying for Miss Debbie Nixon here in just a second. Uh, Miss uh, Brenda Maynard and Brother Larry, as Miss Brenda is continuing to heal from, uh, from her surgery. Um, Robert and Kathy Hinton. Miss Kathy has been diagnosed with shingles. And uh, if you haven't been able to, to catch up on that, I talked with Robert yesterday evening. And uh, Robert said that Kathy had to go to the doctor and that she has shingles now. And so we need to be praying for her. Uh, need uh, be praying. Miss Donna Jordan says, "Please be praying for uh, Jody Kennedy." <coughs> Excuse me, Jody is the one that um, uh, has COVID in North Carolina. They drove over to do the Samaritan's Purse, uh, uh, the Operation Christmas Child with Samaritan's Purse in Charlotte, and he got sick and uh, is still in ICU there. We need to be praying for him. Miss Gina Ivy, continue to pray for her health. Miss Carol Kirby. Uh, praise the Lord, she's healing up finally, and uh, we need to just continue to pray for her healing in her leg. And then same thing for Miss um, Miss Sharon Harmon. Uh, she's asking for prayer as well. And so I'm going to start the list here on my paper, and then I'll see a few that are uh, that are coming up online, and I'll, I'll cover those next. Uh, so Lord, in Jesus' name, I want to lift up uh, Brother Brian McFarland to you. Father, he's gotten a... Um, uh, uh, a very, very bad rash that is uh, uh, really, Lord, just um, uh, in, just invaded his entire body. And Father, we're just asking from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, Lord, would you clear him up? And Father, just calls whatever seems to be out of order, uh, Lord, to bring in order. I know he's been in a lot of pain. And so, Father, uh, uh, just pray that you would calm the itching and uh, allow the hives to... Um, uh, to, to go back down and this rash to clear up and Father you'll get him back on his feet working and doing the things I know that he needs to do for his family uh, Lord I pray for Miss uh, Alma as she's getting ready to see the doctor on the 22nd uh, Lord give them wisdom on what they need to do to treat her but Lord in the meantime we just pray for your healing hand Lord to, uh, to touch her and Father to bring healing to her body Father we pray for Sean as well uh, Miss Peggy's son is having uh, congestive heart failure. God, we just pray that you would touch his heart and, Father, you'd bring healing to him. Lord, in his downtime, Father, I pray uh, that until he sees your hand move, speak to his heart, Lord, minister to him, and let him know that we're lifting him up in prayer. Father, I pray for Miss Kathy Payne, <coughs> excuse me, who's over in Garland with her son and is now staying over there. Father, I pray for her and ask that in Jesus' name that you would help uh, her health. That's the reason that she's moved over there to be closer to her doctors. And so, Father, would you uh, just touch her, give those doctors wisdom on how it is, that, uh, what it is they need to treat her with. 
with the wisdom that you can give. But Lord, ultimately we know you can touch and heal her as well. Father, we pray the same thing for Miss Brenda Maynard. God, thank you for the work that has you've begun of healing in her. And Father, would you please just continue to do that work and continue, Lord, just to bring her back uh, to her full health. Be with Brother Larry as he stands with her, supports her, and loves her through this time of healing. And Father, I pray the same thing for Kathy and uh, Robert. Lord, I pray that uh, you would just heal Miss Kathy, cause these nerve endings that have uh, developed with these uh, shingles. Father, I pray that you would allow the pain and the discomfort that comes with that, uh, Lord, to be arrested. I pray your skin would clear up. And Lord, these nerves endings would be healed in the mighty name of Jesus. Be with Robert as he serves her and stands with her uh, at this time. Uh, Lord, I pray for uh, Miss Donna's request of Jody Kennedy, who is in Charlotte, North Carolina. Lord, I thank you that you're a God that's not restricted in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And so, Father, let Brother Jody know right now, reach inside that hospital, bed, uh, hospital room in his bed, lift him up by way of your spirit, and God, let him know that we're interceding on his behalf. God, clear up the pneumonia that's in his lungs. Clear this uh, COVID-19 virus out of his body. And Lord, raise this uh, mighty servant of the Lord back up and that he and his wife could, uh, Lord, continue to serve you as missionaries of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Father, I pray for health for Miss Gina, for Miss Carol, and Miss Sharon. Each one of them, Father, have different issues. And uh, Lord, uh, you know what they are. And so, Father, we just pray that you would minister to the physical needs of each one of these uh, godly ladies. And Father, you would do it in a way that only you can. Father, we'll give you praise and honor and glory for that in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I'm also seeing on here that Mary's dad is um, needing prayer this evening. I believe that he fell. And so would you just be with Mary and Glenn as they continue just to, uh, uh, just to be with uh, Mary's dad and minister to him. I pray that there's no harm or, or, or injury that has come to him this afternoon. And so, Lord, would you just do uh, the work that needs to be done with him? Give Glenn and Mary the strength uh, to continue on ministering to him and helping him in whatever way that you see fit. So, Lord, just be with Glenn and Mary and Mary's dad. And, Father, we're going to thank you for the healing hand and healing touch that you're going to put upon him. Father, uh, Yvonne is asking that... Um, uh, have to find, she has to find a new apartment by March 1st. And so, Lord, here in Sulphur Springs, and so uh, we're praying for you on that sister, that in the mighty name of Jesus, that um, uh, you would meet her needs. Uh, Lord, her needs are many, as she says here in, the, in her online request. Her needs are many. God, you know each and every one of those needs. And, Father, I pray that you would uh, meet those needs. Lord, would you uh, give her... Provide for her uh, the new apartment, just like Miss Debbie. Provide for these uh, ladies, Lord God, uh, that they, you would open the door that needs to be open for them and help them, Lord God, to be able just to know and to praise you that it's your hand working on their behalf. And so, Lord, whatever other needs beyond the physical, whether it's mental, emotional, financial, spiritual, Father, I pray that for my sister here tonight, you would meet those needs. She says that there are many here, and so, Lord, you're a God that owns a cattle on a thousand hills. You stick closer than a brother. And so, Lord, would you just open the windows of heaven and pour out your blessings upon her right now. Um, also pray for uh, Miss D that says, pray for those that are out in the cold tonight. And, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we do pray for those that are homeless, that, God, you would provide for them, you would protect them through this cold night. and. And really the, the cold rest of the week and the weekend as it's only going to get worse as this Arctic blast uh, comes through our area here in East Texas. And so God, would you just uh, provide the shelter and the needs for those that are homeless that in the mighty name of Jesus, they would know, Father, without a doubt, that Jesus is their provider and their provision. May the testimony of the, the living God through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, be with them. Grant them peace and meet their needs at this time. We pray all of this now in Christ's name. Amen and amen. All right. Well, we're so glad that you joined us online. Thank you all for all of y'all that have um, 
uh, put your prayer needs down, and I'm just scrolling through one more time just to make sure I don't miss any. Uh, if you have any other prayer needs, we do pray uh, in the morning times here at the church. You can uh, email us here at the church initials nbfbc.org, uh, New Beginnings Fellowship Baptist Church, the initials nbfbc, and just send it to Diane, D-I-A-N-E, Diane at nbfbc.org. Um, again, we want to thank you for, for being with us and for those that are in-house. Looking forward to Friday night. I'm hoping we don't get snowed out, uh, but we're, uh, we're going to watch it day by day, and we'll make the call on uh, on Friday on what it looks like on whether we can we can uh, make our unconditional love banquet for for everyone uh, that's gonna be a fun time I'm looking forward to that it's gonna be fun and so uh, for those of you that can make it uh, if you haven't signed up our list yet I think we're uh, we're close to 50 people that's gonna be here we're gonna spread out in the gym uh, there's plenty of room to spread out that many people and uh, so if you want to be a part of that on Friday night uh, our unconditional love uh, banquet. Come and be a part of that for Valentine's. Bring your, bring your honey or bring your friend. Uh, it's for friends and honeys all together, your wife, spouses. And we're also going to be playing the dating game up here uh, with four of our couples. And so I'm looking forward to that. And so um, uh, God bless you. You have a good rest of the week. And uh, if I don't see you on Friday, uh, we'll see you on Sunday for sure. God bless you. And you have a blessed rest of the week. Hey, be a living testimony this week to somebody. Let them see the godliness in you and who you are in Christ. Amen. God bless you.